Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, May 26, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. And I'm Rob Dew. And here's a look at some of our top stories. Tonight, Trump crosses the magic number to clinch the Republican nomination, and he sends shivers down the spines of globalist nations. Then, Ron Paul and John McAfee speak out on policies, politicians, and the political process. And we dissect a media lie. Katie Couric's documentary was edited to make it appear that pro-gun spokesmen were unable to respond to her direct question. Gun purchasers. How do you prevent felons or terrorists from purchasing gun? Well, it took a whole mess of primaries, 17 other candidates, and a whole buttload of debates. But <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump has finally won the nomination. This came out of the AP this morning. He has secured enough delegates. He's at 1238 right now when they count the, uh, what are they called, the unbound delegates. When they bring those into account, he's actually got the number he needs to clinch the Republican nomination. Right. So. Bernie has his weaponized supporters and protesters We've got weaponized delegates here. <laughs> all, all that's done, though, all of Bernie supporters, all, they basically assured a Donald Trump nomination. He didn't even need California. Exactly. I exactly. mean, can you even imagine how many more delegates he's going to get once they see what happens in California tomorrow it's, night? It's gonna, he's going to be well over 1350, I think. They're going to the build that wall. <laughs> yeah. And that's going to piss off a lot of people who are here illegally. So. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. It is going to be fireworks there. Now, this is coming out of Japan Times. And they're saying Trump is sending shivers down the spines of nations who are trying to solidify this global warming pact. Now, this is something that whoever gets elected, um, if this goes through before they get elected, they'll have four years until they can undo it. So Trump has already made it very clear that he is definitely going to be renegotiating this at a bare minimum. And he said at maximum, he's going to do something else with it. So all of these globalist nations that have been working on getting around uh, the American people, of course, with these corporations, they're really shivering over a Trump presidency. And this is something that has really, you know, David Knight has said, this is one of the main reasons why he will back Trump, because he wants to knock out those legs that are going to prop up a one world government. And we've seen time and time again that, that this whole global warming, carbon credit stuff is not about saving the planet. Mm -hmm. It is about basically controlling resources. That's what they want to do. They want to control the world's resources, put them in a giant pot, and then have you know, unelected bureaucrats divvy them up how they see fit. It has nothing to do with the environment. If it had something to do with the environment, they'd be looking at stuff like uh, geoengineering and uh, genetically modified organisms. There's never any talk about that. It's just carbon, what we exhale. There's no regulation. Yeah, there's no regulations on fracking out in the ocean. There are the NOAA. We have them setting off uh, weapons underwater. You know, right. they no don't talk about that. They don't really care if that's going to destroy the entire ecosystem. But you and I need to curtail breathing. our breathing. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's not just the globalists that are afraid of Trump. You also have all these people creating Twitter accounts where they're calling for his assassination. And then here's a story from Paul Joseph Watson today. Beck calls Drudge evil for suggesting he advocated a patriot killed Donald Trump. And let's just go look at the exchange. This is between him and one of his, uh, one of Beck's minions, Brad Thor. And uh, I'm about to suggest something very bad. It's a hypothetical I'm going to ask as a thriller writer with a feckless, spineless Congress, who will we have? Who will stand in the way of Donald Trump overstepping his constitutional authority as president? Yeah, because we've seen the Congress stop, you know, people like Obama or George Bush from overstepping right. their constitutional authority. Yeah. But already we know Donald Trump's going to overstep his before he's even gotten into office, before he's even won the presidency. But I like, continue. If Congress won't remove him from office, what patriot will step up and do that if mm -hmm. he oversteps his mandate as president? His constitution mandate authority as president, I should say. If he oversteps that, how do we get him out of office? And I don't think there is a legal means available. I think it will be a terrible, terrible position the American people will be in to get Trump out of office because you won't be able to do it through Congress. And then Beck said, I would no, agree, I would agree with, with you on, you on that. that. I mean, yeah. what are they thinking? So they're thinking they're going to need the, a revolution to rise up to get Trump out of office? He hasn't even done anything yet. No, and it. they... This is pre-crime. Can you imagine if they <laughs> had it. said something like this about Obama, saying, what patriot is going to take him out? Oh, yeah, exactly. How do you think people are well, going to interpret Well, wouldn't do that because he's actually in there to keep Obama in office and, and cover for him 
to give left cover or right cover, I guess right. I should say. Right, because as soon as Ron Paul was no longer a threat, then all of a sudden he backs Ron Paul. Exactly. He is a total fake. Now we have someone else actually coming out challenging Donald Trump. This is Bernie Sanders challenging him to a debate. This is uh, Adon Salazar has this article up that the socialist candidate is now attempting an upward attack as his campaign is in the death rows. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel gave Donald Trump a statement from the Sanders camp when he appeared on the show the other night and uh, Hillary Clinton declined having a debate. With, with Bernie Sanders, because she already knows it's in She's the She's in free fall, her. too, yeah. It's not going to help her chances win California whatsoever. And I personally would like to see the Trump-Sanders debate, even though it's it'll be pretty meaningless in terms of how this race is going to play out. But in terms of the socialist versus capitalism theologies going head-to-head, -head, I think it's what this country needs more than anything. That's what I think, is because we have so many people out there with these Bernie supporters who haven't ever even actually listened to any uh, anything that Trump is proposing. And then to see how does that counter with what Bernie is saying. Because I guarantee Trump is going to say, well, how would you pay for that, Bernie Sanders? How? I'm going to raise the Social Security tax. Economics a yeah. little bit. And people don't understand, like, you have a lot of different taxes taken out of your paycheck. Just because you may or may not pay income tax at the end of the year, they're still taking payroll tax out. They're taking out Social Security. There's all kind of things that Bernie Sanders is going to raise up the level right. to level the playing field for everyone. Right. If you still have a take job, if you still have a job after you get your $15 an hour, right, right. It's sure. 70% of that is now going to go to taxes, so you're going to be making even less than what you're making. And right then now. the robots are going to replace you even faster. Right. So. Yeah. And so now Don't learn <laughs> skills. Don't take your own destiny into your hands and like better yourself in your free time. Just watch TV. Don't do it. Go to Facebook. Just pound your fist exactly. on a desk. Yeah, take treat off this free. campus. Take free. this hate street off this campus. Treat the leaf puff. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I got to calm down. <laughs> Devolving here. <sighs> but now we have a, a new poll out, a new survey. This is a NBC News and the Wall Street Journal. They conducted a poll and they found that voters most associate Hillary Clinton with the words liar, not trustworthy, <laughs> and scandals. Now, we could have told you that, but this is, you know, you're saying on a free fall. Absolutely. She is finally getting out there with like these little word clouds containing mostly negative words. People are no longer fall. You know what? Actually, we've got some video of oh, yeah, the green right. on the streets earlier this year taking our own poll. I think I'm ready for a woman. Okay. But to me, voting for Hillary because she's a woman is, is, is like eating a turd because it looks like a Tootsie Roll. Very true. I agree. Now, I would agree with that video. Hillary does kind of look like a turd. So... <laughs> Uh, anyway, a tyrannical let's, turd. A tyrannical turd who wants to take over everything and make everything smell bad. <laughs> it, this came out of the AP today. Origin of key Clinton emails from report are a mystery. Now we have mystery emails. Because she didn't turn those over. Oh, I forgot. The agency found an audit of at least three emails never seen before, including Clinton's own explanation of why she wanted to keep her emails private, which we talked about yesterday. The existence of these previously unreleased messages appeared to be, a, be found among electronic files of four former top Clinton State Department aides. Renews concern that Clinton was not completely forthcoming when she turned over a trove of 55,000 pages no. of work-related email. Yeah, she, she would never do that. She said she turned them all over. And it's drawn fresh criticism from the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump. And it's gotten so bad, even the Washington Post, which is basically water carriers for the liberal establishment, has come out and said, Clinton's inexcusable willful disregard for the rules. But of course, I think that's as far as they're going to say. Yeah, they're not going to say she needs to be uh, trumped out of here. By Yesterday, this I was say, uh, seeing on um, CNN, MSNBC, they had on there. But some of that corroborate her previous statements. Some of the audit yeah, report oh, shows it's like, yeah, but also some of it shows what a complete criminal she was. Willful negligence. She knew hey, some of it that knows, her computer she, was she, being hacked into. She knows into. how to spell. You know, so she, <laughs> she writes in complete sentences. Some of it showed that. You know? It's very clear <laughs> that she set up that private server because she did not want the State Department to access her what, oh, what personal yoga emails. What difference does it make? Or yeah, also exactly. selling uranium to the Russians. Now, let's move on from Hillary Clinton to something else that happened to really disturb me today. Uh, a friend sent this link over the Alamo Draft House. It's a really, it's a great movie theater here in Austin. I love to go watch movies there. But now they are seeking the public's feedback on gender <laughs> neutral bathroom design. So this is the uh, Tim Leake. He's the Draft House founder. And 
he put these uh, drawings up on the Facebook page of this bathroom idea, which is a inclusive, commercial, gender neutral restroom design. And he wants to, so the challenges are not even part of the dialogue. So there's a little man corral area where there, well, no. are those urinals? What are those? These Public are your, okay. So here's the thing is, basically they're saying that they want the design element to completely eliminate the conflict. And so how are they going to do that? They're going to create gender so everyone in the same urinals. Bathroom. Ugh. urinals that men and women can use. So you'll be standing side by side with other people who are standing up to pee. Are you serious? I am serious. These, I mean, so <laughs> we have gone, we've gone totally in hyperdrive from gender inclusive to now physics defying because women are not made to pee standing up, first of all. And I wonder who came up with this, how long it's been going on and you know, because you know this isn't just something they came off the... Oh, we got a little spider crawling across <laughs> right now. Yeah, he's looking Weaving for a Weaving spiders come out here. <laughs> uh, anyway, how how did they come up with... Like, we have this plan ready. Like, who came up with this? Yeah. Like, in what dark room are they going, we have to get everybody to pee together in the same spot? Everybody needs to just be comfortable with your little girl standing next to a grown man. Forget about if it's the man identifies as a woman... Just everybody in there all together. They could just spread newspapers out in corners of the theater and just have people pee in the corners. Yeah. Or set or up, you know, a green away. space with giant fire hydrants or something. Everybody well, could go pee and poop on those. This is this is what we need to demand because, you know what, this is just the beginning of this whole oh, sure. transgender, the tra gender Trans identity. Species. There's actually 58 gender identities on Facebook. So we are going to have to start creating bathrooms for everyone. I mean, how far are we going to take this? This is just the beginning. So... We also have this article uh, out of The Guardian. The men who live as dogs, they're just the same as any person on the high Because we have to cater to all mental illnesses now. These are humans who like to live in packs, play with squeaky toys, eat from bowls, nuzzle their owners. So this is their... Pump their legs. ...identity. And you... <laughs> you. <laughs> this, is so, this is so weird. <laughs> My yeah. God. These guys want to oh, pee yeah. with your kids. These are normal bathroom. people. They they need to hike their leg up in peace. Well, that's what we all fours. need to do. If we can just have AstroTurf and fire hydrants. In fact, we, we have an artist rendition of what this would look like. <laughs> a, a whole new world of, there it is right there. We got fire hydrants. We got the dogs picking up poop. We got the dog people. We got women peeing in the bushes, giant fire hydrant urinals. I mean, it's all set up, ready just to go. We should probably submit this corner. as feedback to the Alamo. Like, why don't you just do this? Yes. This is better. That we can is train an dogs. Excellent It'll, idea. You know, there you go. That's excellent. Let's take idea. it all the way. If we're just going to do it partially and just have men and women getting together in bathrooms, peeing and pooping together, why don't we do it outside, out in public so everybody can just see it? Yeah. Well, that's we, what, that's we have to what hide? this is all about. It's like eliminating privacy, eliminating the individual being a part of the collective, and people are much easier to control if they're part of a collective rather than trying to control a bunch of little individuals here and, and there. It's going to be people in dog masks controlling you, by the oh way. Oh, my goodness. But what could go wrong? What could go wrong if we had men and women peeing together? Well, let's look at this article. This is out of the Daily Mail. Saudi father shoots doctor shortly after he delivered his wife's baby because he didn't want a man to see his spouse naked. Right. So this are guy you, delivers what? his baby, and then he gets killed by the lady's father uh husband what you know when my wife gave birth to i don't know four kids there was all kind of people in there every time right and that's not what we were concerned about we were concerned with having a healthy baby obviously this guy i mean this is the mental illness we're going to be dealing with right well can you imagine these guys here. sharing a because bathroom because we have to let all the muslims come and that's what people need now. to understand we're bringing them all in you want your transgender gonna bathroom happen? you're going to get tossed off a building someone's going to toss you off the parking lot at the alamo draft house so good job, guys. Now, this one's coming out of The Federalist. Uh, I thought this was a great article where this uh, the author, Stella Moravito, says a de-sexed society is a dehumanized society. And this is something that Alex has been talking about for years, that this is about dehumanizing people. And so trying to, like, where did this whole transgender thing come from? We don't even have definitions, yet they're already creating federal laws. You, they could, need right, you could be you know. fined. And it's not like nobody's trying to deny anybody any rights. It's just you don't want a guy with a penis going into where women with vaginas go to the bathroom. And what's wrong with that? Well, the thing that really frustrated me is that why do women have to rearrange the way that they've been going to the bathroom for millennia? Because all of a sudden now they, they want to have gender neutral urinals. 
I mean, why? That's the patriarchy. I feel very oppressed by the patriarchy <laughs> telling me that now I, I need just to keep laughing. Figure out how to stand up. To Next time at the Alamo Draft House, I'm going to be peeing next to some lady who's like kind of squatting next to this weird urinal thing that's no, supposed to be unisex. It's absolutely terrible. This is going <laughs> to totally backfire on them. But this article talks about how if you can so take crazy. away people's sex, male, female, and try to yeah. rewrite the reality of science of what it is, then the government can start saying there is no mother, father, no right. son, no daughter. Yeah. It's you're the legal guardian of that person that lives in your home. And you know what? Maybe but we mold their mind during the day. Exactly. And maybe we maybe we decide you're not fit to be their legal guardian anymore, but you're not their mother or father or they're not your child because the family structure has been completely eliminated. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what where they want. This is they going. want kids living in dormitories being raised by the state being subjected to that brainwashing mind control. Not about individuality, not about freedom. It's all about this weird collective where you can't say certain words because they may offend somebody. You know, it, it goes back and to the old adage. it changes attitude. from, you know, Sticks day to day. and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And yeah. the fact that they don't teach kids this anymore is just atrocious. Sticks and stones might be breaking some bones, though, oh. if you uh, try to... By the way, we're talking about Trump uh, winning the nomination. We have a special video from Alex Jones coming up where he goes into this and basically declares Trump winner of the presidency because I mean, you look at what Hillary is right now. She's in free fall. They're probably going to try to sneak Biden in through the back door. But, you know, people are going to be like, wait, he didn't go through any scrutiny at all. We're just going to say, oh, Joe Biden, creepy yeah. Joe gets it. Go Creepy's buy a shotgun. Joe. Yeah, I can't go wait. Buy for, a shotgun. <laughs> can't wait for those hit pieces yeah. to come out. Yeah. Did you see me trying to shoot the shotgun? <laughs> Fail. We also have an interview with libertarian candidate running for president, John McAfee, as well as Ron Paul. Stop by the Alex Jones show today. All that's coming right up. Dr. Paul, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, you look great. It's good to have you with us via your uh, your uh, Skype connection. Thank you, Alex. Good to see you today. We've got about a two or three second delay, so I'll try to just uh, you know not jump in too much, just with a few questions. You heard what I threw out. Uh, where would you like to start? With the moves to censor? I, I don't think I've ever seen with Facebook and uh, all the rest of them being caught, uh, censorship of this magnitude. I think we live in an age where there's no understanding and no respect whatsoever for personal liberty and personal privacy. The founders understood it much better. They tried to protect us against a big government that would come in and destroy that. But there is a collusion between big business, corporatism, and big government that are in, in, in control. So therefore, they can control the output. It used to be that uh, newspapers did it in three major networks, and uh, it was uh, we understood it. And then it changed when... There were more cable stations and internet stations and all, but they haven't quit. They're still challenging us. And you're right, the IRS has not been kind to us. They've been after us quite a few different times on some of our organizations, and they continue to do it. They uh, like to bankrupt us, uh, you know, through all the money you have to spend to try to defend oneself. But I think what we're witnessing today is a result of an era ending. And I've talked about this for maybe five or plus years about the end of an era. Because I believe the era of big government, uh, the progressive era, uh, really exhausted itself uh, probably at the end of the last century. And now we have just been fidgeting and trying to keep things together. And that's why, you know, the political parties are in shambles, the economy's in shambles, civil liberties are in shambles. But the real problem is that the system we have today isn't working, it's ending. Keynesian economics doesn't work, that model is bad and, and never worked, but that was the substitute for fascism and communism. And the 20th century did a pretty good job at uh, smashing it because it's a total failure. And there are still some who would like to be socialists and think that Venezuela is the way to go and all this nonsense. But you know, the markets are very powerful, the market said, that fascism and communism failed, but the substitute, the American substitute of Keynesianism, economic planning, central banking, inflationism, uh, fiat money, and uh, running our lives, regulating our lives, taking away our liberties, and also this obsession with us believing that we are so exceptional that we can tell the rest of the world how to live, and we should be exceptional in, de in, de in dealing with our own problems and setting a good example. But so I think the mess that we're in today is the end of this era, and without anybody admitting this, we and th those in the freedom movement have been trying to warn people of this and giving them an option, and quite frankly, I think we're doing fine there, even though, like you mentioned, Alex, on the introduction, that, uh, you know, uh, statism and big governments is alive and well. 
but they're bankrupt, so they will end, just as our empire will end, Keynesian economics will fail, the central banking system is going to fail. We just have to concentrate on it to energize another generation that there is an option for this, there is an alternative, and of course, that's what I've been working on for quite a few years. Absolutely, Dr. Paul. Uh, expanding on that, looking at what the so-called left is doing, allied with the establishment Republicans in this country, similarly in Europe, where I know you've traveled and spoken extensively as well, they now, because they were discredited last century, as you said, are instead just trying to dumb everyone down and really much overthrow reality and overthrow the engines of free market that are left because they just can't compete with that even existing. Even though it brings down the civilization, they'd rather rural uh, people you know, not be able to take care of themselves. They'd rather city people not be able to take care of themselves. Uh, they'd rather uh, the whole country and the whole world be poor and rule a huge junk pile instead of a great civilization. And so my concerns are, what do you see them doing in their death rows? Because even most mainline analysts are starting to agree with you that we're coming to the end of a bubble, uh, that no matter what the establishment does, they're not going to be able to suppress change. More and more young people are waking up. So clearly, I agree with you, this great turning that, you, that you've talked about for decades, but, but you've said is very close for five years is pretty much here. Uh, but, but how do you expect the empire to strike back? I mean, I think we're seeing it. Open, naked authoritarianism, but doesn't that only accelerate uh, the fall of their system? Well, yes, they're, they're a failure, but they will strike out. And uh, I think that what they have going for them right now is the dumbing down of America. So in many ways, they have been successful by getting hold of the public school system and teaching people, you know, bad economics and bad foreign policy and, and all the things that uh, are wrong. But at the same time, uh, you know, the failure is there. I think they know that the failure is there, but they will strike out and they will become more authoritarian. And I think that is exactly what they're doing. And it isn't a partisan thing when you know that the Nancy Pelosi's of the world and the John Boehner's of the world were much, much more buddies than anybody realized. But that continues. The parties, the parties mean very little. But I think if nothing else, this current election cycle that's going on uh, represents the dumbing down of America. But then again, uh, does that mean we should be exhausted and run for the hills or should we continue the fight? Obviously, uh, I'm here for the fight. And to me, it's an intellectual fight and we have to beat them with better ideas. And I think there is a receptive audience out there. But what they, they have power because they're in control right now. But what we have on our side is that ideas have consequences. You can't stop ideas. Uh, it, uh, even, even the armies and the governments can't stop ideas if their time has come. Joining us now is John McAfee. Welcome, Mr. McAfee. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm very interested to hear your voice. I think the Libertarian Party needs your voice. I think America needs your voice in the discussion. We are threatened with a lot of vital issues. I think the border issues, the trade issues that we see that Donald Trump has tapped into, I think those are vital issues. But there's another vital issue that nobody is talking about, and that is the big brother aspect of massive surveillance. And there's many other issues that I don't really see candidates like Gary Johnson addressing. Uh, four years ago when he was running, he basically focused his campaign on government redefining marriage, on being pro-abortion, and on pot legalization, which is fine, except that those first two things are not even necessarily something that all libertarians agree on. We had pro-life libertarians when I was in the Libertarian Party. Uh, a lot of people don't believe that the government should have any role in defining marriage. And when it comes to pot legalization, that's fine, but I think we need to focus on the broader problems of drug prohibition in general. Then I was very disturbed to see that he's picking uh, William Weld, a guy who has supported assault weapon bans. He has yes. uh, supported other gun control measures. He supported the Iraq War 10 months, 10 months after the invasion. Uh, he's failed to oppose the Patriot Act. As a matter of fact, he worked as a DEA enforcer for Ed Meese. And this is a guy who gave us a civil asset forfeiture. Now, he eventually forced Ed Meese out for personal corruption charges, but he should have forced him into jail for giving us something like civil asset forfeiture. So I'm very disturbed to see the Libertarian Party moving in the direction of having these career politicians, which is what uh, Gary Johnson and... Um, uh, William Weld are, in my opinion. I think they need to be brought into the 21st century with issues like you're addressing. Talk to us about the vitality of cybersecurity and what we need to do to protect us from the government. 
Well, with your permission, sir, I'd like to talk some, about something far more important. Sure. Uh, we're talking about issues, uh, but there's an issue that absolutely no one has addressed. And that is, that when Dwight Eisenhower left office in the 50s, he warned us about something called, called the military-industrial complex. That connection between government and industry, which would only cause greater power in both of those. Um, <clears throat> you talk, we're, we, Gary Johnson talks about presidential debates. If we don't get into the debate, we're lost, so he's suing the debate commission. Well, we know that's not going to go to court until after the election. We know how the, the court process works, so it's yeah. other nonsense. At the, last, at the Las Vegas debate that Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller put together, I did the debate like everybody else. In my closing statement, I got up and said, what you have watched is utter, complete nonsense, fabricated by the media in the 60s and perpetrated by the media for the media. And let me explain. What do you have in a presidential debate? You have opening statements and closing statements written by speech writers, not yeah. the candidate himself. You have a candidate that has been coached by dozens in and. As a matter of fact, I think we lost transmission there for a moment. One of the founders of the Libertarian Party was a speechwriter for Goldwater, who had that famous uh, comment, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in defense of justice is no virtue, if I got that correct. I may not have gotten that exactly right, but you're exactly right. Remember when the American president boldly proclaimed a respect of liberty and the freedoms expressed in the Constitution of the United States? We should give particular attention to the needs of those countries which share our view of the world crisis. Our view of the world crisis is that countries are entitled to national sovereignty and independence. That is all we have ever suggested. That is the purpose of our aid, to make it more possible. Now, if a country has uh, ceased to choose national sovereignty, or ch ceased to choose a national independence, uh, then, of course, our aid uh, becomes less useful. Well, take a look at who is steering the ship today. The New World Order Panderer-in-Chief, President Obama was recently in Vietnam hyping the prospect of slashing tariffs on products imported into the United States, aggressively pushing a multinational corporation's sovereign-killing trade deal linking 40% of the global economy into a full-blown smackdown on the already struggling U.S. economy. The LA Times writes, Ordinarily, a presidential administration would wait until Congress ratifies a trade agreement before putting it into force with member nations. But with just eight months left in office and presidential candidates Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and Bernie Sanders all against the deal, Obama and his advisors appear to have concluded that they must speed up that lengthy process to preserve the trade pact. This president of ours is blatantly taking this country down and spreading his belly full of total loathing for America across the globe. This is the same president that signed the NDAA in the middle of the night after threatening to veto it, a document guaranteeing that American citizens can be disappeared by the authorities without any explanation, much less their rights. These people are saying that the passing of the bill, basically it means to them that the Rubicon has been crossed that uh, this means America will become complete and possibly irreversible a totalitarian military state. Well, then our only hope is some defective armed force members. I think that's our only chance is the military needs to enforce our constitution and our congressmen are trampling over the rules that were established over 200 years ago. And that's the whole problem. There's too much corruption in the executive branch and in the congressional. The same president behind a draft to install a government official into each home to oversee your children. The document states, the first step in systematically embedding effective family engagement practices in educational settings is to establish a culture where families are seen as assets and partners in children's development. The same president that lied his tail off to get into office in order to enact globalist New World Order directives while simultaneously rewarding the corporate demons running the central banks with toppled regimes and more central banks. 
Obama is the first president in U.S. history to not see a single year of 3% GDP growth. That is who was apologizing to Japan and Vietnam for the rhetoric of Donald Trump. They're rattled by and for good reason, because a lot of the uh, proposals that he's made display either ignorance of world affairs or a cavalier attitude or an interest in getting tweets and headlines instead of actually thinking through what it is that is required to keep America safe and secure and prosperous. If they're rattled in a friendly way, we're going to have great relationships with these countries. He's a president who's done a horrible job. Everybody understands that. He's a president who's allowed many of these countries to totally take advantage of him and us, unfortunately. And he's got to say something. And it's unusual that every time he has a press conference, he's talking about me. Say what you want about Trump. The majority group who support Trump are white families with a lot of money. How be it? You are an absolute fool if you can't stomach the facts and realize that Obama is a thousand times worse. In years to come, if the United States is still here, we will be adamantly apologizing for electing President Barack Obama to two terms. In America, there's a failure to appreciate Europe's leading role in the world. Instead of celebrating your dynamic union and seeking to partner with you to meet common challenges, there have been times where America's shown arrogance and been dismissive. John Bound for Infowars.com. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be. We have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is a big idea, a new world order, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think, only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. So that the problem of the Bush presidency will be the emergence of a new international order. Within the next four years, we will see the emergence of a new international the beginning, order. The beginning of a new international order. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. There's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of the, of the world. But today, with Asia already outproducing Europe, India and China are clearly becoming part of our new order. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Good evening, everybody. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see.
So I see a world order in the future with a multipolar world order. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. But in a globalized economy, we are going to have to take global responsibilities and there going to, is going to have to be some semblance of global governance. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. And I strongly believe India will be a central actor in the new world order. There also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. New World Order is the headline in the Globe and Mail in Canada. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world, the central bankers in charge? But aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? Of course we are. We are absolutely slaves to central banks. Welcome back. Joining me in the studio now is Joe Biggs. You have just gotten back from the annual NRA event. Of course, they announced that they were backing Trump there. How'd yeah, it go? It was pretty awesome. I mean, to be around 70,000 people who are just like you, maybe not as cool as me, but it was pretty awesome. I mean, to see all the, the new weapons, like the neatest new tactical equipment, ammunition that's not out there on the market, you know, there's two guns that were made out of a meteorite. I mean, it was amazing. Guns all over the place, beautiful women with guns. It, it was a dream. So you weren't frightened by all those guns? No, nah, I mean, I was surprised, you know, I, I, I've listened to Hillary Clinton from time to time and you know, the way she makes it sound like these guns are just going to jump up off these counters and shoot me in the head. And not one person was shot there the entire time. Yeah. It was actually ended up being one of the safest places in America for about three days straight. <laughs> but most likely. So did, did, did anyone there, I know you had the opportunity to speak, uh, did anyone there kind of get into um, a lot of this push for gun control? I know some people were asked there at the NRA event how they felt about gun control. What was the air like there? Everybody was pretty stoked at the time that I got there because, uh, you know, they had just announced that the NR was going to back Trump. So everybody was kind of like walking around their chest out a little bit more because they knew that, all right, if the NRA is going to back this guy, we're going to go in, you know, all the way. So it was it was a pretty, uh, pretty happy crowd. And I don't think a lot of people are really, I don't know, like I'm kind of on the fence. I think a lot of this is, I think the the Democrats are kind of playing a game. Sometimes I feel like they're the the silent partners you know, in a company, you know, but every time they, they, they say they're going to push for gun control, what happens? Gun sales goes up. Surge. You know, right. I, I think there's something they're doing. I don't Playing know. Playing both sides of the fence. Yeah. You could actually be onto something because uh, as we know, if they are able to disarm the population, we are going the way of Venezuela very quickly. Now there is um, a documentary that's out and uh, Katie Cork was the producer for it. It's called Under the Gun. And this is a complete swipe at people who believe in the Second Amendment. It was supposed to be a documentary that showed both sides of the gun control issue. And now some of the uh, people, the Virginia Citizens Defense League, they say they were interviewed for this supposed fair and balanced documentary and they were completely edited in a deceptive way. And you have to remember, this is that Katie Couric. Oh, well, this is Katie Couric who came out against the Planned Parenthood videos that surfaced and like really got behind the charge that those videos were deceptively edited. Here, you're gonna see here that they actually engaged in deceptive editing. So she's talking to the VCDL and she asks them how they feel about gun control. Let me ask you another question. If there are no background checks for gun purchasers, how do you prevent felons or terrorists from purchasing a gun? So as you can see, they want to make it appear as though these people have absolutely no counter argument to, you know, what would you do? A terrorist could just walk in and get a gun. And this is the big argument that they're always making, uh, that they're trying to say, this is why we need a gun registry, gun control. And now 
they, uh, the VCDL has actually come out with their version of the unedited audio. And it's actually five minutes long. Everyone had a really great response. Totally shut Katie down. And that part was edited out. Take a listen. How do you prevent felons or terrorists from walking into, say, a licensed gun dealer and purchasing a gun? Well, one, if, if you're not in jail, you should still have your basic rights and you should go buy a gun. So if you're uh, a terrorist so or a felon? If you're, if you're a felon and you've done your time, you should have your rights. What well, the you fact think? is we do have statutes, both at the federal and state level, that prohibit classes of people from being in possession of firearms. So as you can see, they weren't stunned into silence with Katie's question. I mean, this is what you have to remember. When you go out and you're speaking truth or you're a, an organization that's pro second amendment or you do like we do at InfoWars, whenever you go to one of these mainstream media places, you always bring your own camera crew for this reason alone. So kudos to these guys for being smart enough to go in there and film the actual interview so they could take that back when they go out and bulldoze it like she did and then go, hey, no, this is what actually happened. This is a hit piece. So, you know, bravo for that. I mean, because that's right. what everyone has to remember to do. If you're ever invited on a show like that, anything like that, you bring someone there to have a backup plan to film that. So when they do something like that, you're good to go. And you can actually get the truth out that you were intending to in the first place. Right, and that'll become the even bigger story. And now people can challenge Katie Couric's journalistic integrity. And as we know, this is not the first time deceptive editing has been used. Meanwhile, the establishment media will go ahead and they won't back up anything with the whole Planned Parenthood videos. And she was one of the main culprits in this, speaking to her huge audience. So, Well, speaking of hatchet jobs, it looks like Bernie is challenging Trump to a debate. So things might get bloody <laughs> in a rumble down under. This is an article up by Don Salazar. Democrat candidate Bernie Sanders has challenged Republican nominee Donald Trump to a debate ahead of the California primary amid mathematical improbabilities the Brooklyn Socialist will win his party's nomination. Now, during a Jimmy Kimmel Live interview Wednesday, the host presented Trump with a statement from the Sanders campaign requesting a debate after Democrat frontrunner front Hillary Clinton declined. So what do you think about this, Leanne? We've kind of been, I don't, I don't know, I've been kind of excited to see if this is ever going to happen. What do you think? Well, no, wait. So she declined debating Donald Trump? She declined to debate uh, Bernie Sanders again. Wow, because she doesn't even want to give him any more attention. Well, she and, thinks it's over already. Yeah, she's, well, I mean, it's in the bag because, of course, all those weaponized protesters were focusing all of their attention on Trump rather than Hillary. Well, and her that weaponized superdelegates as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it would be pretty interesting. I know Donald Trump said he'd be down for it as long as the money for all the ratings would go to, like, uh, supporting women's groups. So uh, I want to know what says... We're going to debate in California on June 7th, so I think we should go to this. Oh, for sure. If, 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 happens, if there's ever going to be any kind of clash of any kind, Bernie Sanders supporters hate Trump. Trump supporters aren't going to be violent unless they're, you know, pushed to that limit. Well, but. I feel like maybe the Bernie supporters, because they admit when you go and you you counter their argument that they, ha they haven't even listened to anything Donald Trump has to say. All they've been given is those talking points, racist, homophobic, xenophobic. Maybe they'll actually have the opportunity to listen to two candidates who on both sides are very popular with the nation. So maybe they'll be able to learn something. Well, I'm just curious if it's good, though. I mean, look, he's not Trump's actually not going to be going up against Bernie. So at the end of the day, it really doesn't do him any good. I mean, at the end of the day, all that could really happen is it could hurt him. So I don't know. I'm kind of confused. I'm not really sure if that's a good choice. I mean, if anything, call Hillary out and debate her and let's get those skeletons out of the closet. I want to see Trump and Hillary one on one. I want to see everything come out. I well, want to find out about the skeletons. Because, I, you know, Trump was able to secure the amount of delegates needed to secure the Republican nomination. So now he's got to find out who he's going to pick as VP. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I was just in Kentucky. I was got Rand Paul, my buddy's good friends with him. I'm trying to let him know we need you. Well, we really need him to stay where he is because the VP has no power unless the Yeah, but if we get a new Gingrich out. in there, I don't... And we, we, Rand Paul does way too much good to be the VP, though, because then he'll, he'll take him from a powerful position into, like, a dud position. But that would be pretty awesome. I wish I could be voting for, for Rand Paul. Uh, anything else here? We got about a minute. ISIS Jihadists. ISIS Jihadists allowed to spew hate on Imagine. Twitter for six months without being banned. You know, we still have killed Donald Trump sites up on our pages on Facebook. And yet these guys can go around and brag about killing people and post videos 
propaganda pieces all day long. No one bats an eye. No one gets mad. Well, I'm sick and tired of it. <laughs> Ban them. Ban Get em. rid of them. Yeah. You should see some of the things that people post up on hey, Twitter. Why, why, don't, why don't we see people at Trump rallies stop burning the American flag? Why don't you start burning the ISIS flag? I want to see everybody. I forgot to say, I'm going to be in San Diego tonight with Josh Owens at the San Diego Trump rally tomorrow at 2 p.m. Make sure you're there. Get an ISIS flag. Let's burn that. Let's show them what to really burn. Ooh. Stop burning the American flag. Stop bringing Mexican flags. This is America. All right. That sounds like a real. We're challenge. Americans, not Americans. So be there. All right. That's going to be tomorrow. Obviously, we're going to be very excited to have you guys on the ground. And just based on what we've seen uh, at all of these Trump rallies, and especially this one being in California with such a huge minority population, I predict fireworks. Yeah, I dare someone to throw a rock at me. <sighs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much, Joseph Biggs. And thank you all for tuning in and watching the show tonight. Now, if you are not a Prison Planet subscriber yet, be sure to head over there. You can sign up for a prisonplanet.tv account, share your username and password with up to 20 people at the same time. And of course, you're helping this operation. We appreciate it, and we'll see you here again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.